Welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled to see so many of you here today, this afternoon. My name is Katarina Tratsch, and I'm the director of Stockholm Free World Forum, or Frivärd, as you might know us as. And today, I'm here to introduce the seminar that we're hosting together with the Atlantic Council in Northern Europe. As you know, over the past few years, the issue of Nordic-Baltic Nordic security has become increasingly important and has gained increasingly much attention all over the world. And as the developments go today, this seems to continue to be the case, also in the future. Nordic-Baltic security remains one of the topmost subjects in security discussions on the transatlantic level, on the regional level, but also in Europe. However, the latter one tends to be forgotten. For many, Nordic-Baltic security is something, of a, something that NATO should be concerned about, and of course the countries in the region, but not much a European issue. As you know, one of the major European powers, France, is having its pres presidential elections in a couple of weeks. And the outcome of this is decisive not only for Europe and the future of Europe, but also for the transatlantic link and thus for the regional security here. So therefore, we have gathered here today to discuss something as unusual as Nordic-Baltic security seen from a French perspective. And it's not just any French perspective, it's the French perspective of our keynote speaker, Mr. François Eisbourg. Professor Eisbourg has served on several French governmental advisory bodies. He is the chairman of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Geneva, as well as special advisor for La Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris. In addition, he was one of the co-authors of what we know as the Finnish NATO investigation, officially titled The Effects of Finland's Possible NATO Membership, published in 2016. After Professor Heisburg has given his keynote remarks, we will listen to a distinguished Swedish panel with Ambassador Christer Bingius, who was in turn the inquiry chair of what we call the Swedish NATO investigation, but has its English titled Security in a New Era, Report by the Inquiry on Sweden's International Defense and Security Cooperation. As well as Anna Wislander, who is the director for Northern Europe at the Atlantic Council and the secretary general of the Swedish Defense Association. In the end, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, and I would like to remind you that this session is being broadcasted live. So once you receive the microphone, please introduce yourselves. So please, Professor Eisbrook, welcome. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for receiving me here. It's always a, a pleasure to, to come back to to Stockholm to see old friends uh, and to actually uh, see some sunshine because uh, in Paris it's been pretty grim the last few days. Uh, um, I'm speaking about the weather, of course, not, not, about, the, not about the politics. Uh, our politics are in a surrealistic phase. I'll come back to, to that in, in, a few, in a few minutes very briefly, uh, uh, if only to to make the point that uh, uh, I, I may bring a perspective as a French person, but I'm not sure that it's a French perspective. Uh, uh, we, we will know in a f maybe in a few weeks' time uh, what that perspective may or may not look like. Uh, simply a few points. Uh, you, you, Katarina, you very kindly uh, mentioned the, the Finnish report, which was a uh, by the way, an extraordinary exercise uh, to have been involved with. It was really, really interesting. Uh, the, the Finnish uh, seriousness when it comes to matters relating to security and defense is, 
uh, something which is uh, admirable in, in all sorts of ways, and we were given the means with which to work. A, uh, but I take it, in effect, a little bit as a starting point for this discussion, a, and that is to look at what has changed since the report came out. Because those of you who have read the report know what's in it. I'll say a couple of words about that later on. A, uh, but it may be more interesting, actually, to see what would need to be changed as a consequence of the enormous disruptions uh, which have taken place since the report uh, went online in, in English, uh, Finnish, and Swedish uh, in early May uh, of last year, plus an unofficial translation into Russian to make sure that our translation would be the translation of reference rather than the one being done in Moscow. Uh, what has changed? Well, essentially, two big things. One is Brexit. Uh, that came in June of last year. Uh, that has transformed already the manner in which uh, the successor European Union, the EU27, uh, uh, will be forced to operate or will be able to operate or will choose to operate and I'm, I'm still not sure what is the right uh, uh, verbal combination uh, which uh, will apply. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, we have to uh, look at security and defense policy in a manner uh, which uh, we had never before been forced to look at. Uh, the EU without the British in, a, in an age in which the EU does have security and defense uh, dimensions. The second big thing, and indeed the bigger one, is the election of Donald Trump in the United States. Uh, there are several dimensions here. One was already in play before the election of Mr. Trump, and that was the geopolitical, geostrategic shift of the world and therefore of America's own priorities towards East Asia. The pivot to Asia, as President Obama uh, put it in uh, the speech in Canberra in which he launched uh, uh, this uh, basic initiative, but it's not so much an initiative as a reckoning of uh, trends of very deep, very major trends, which are not, of course, going away any time soon. That's the backdrop against which Mr. Trump will also be operating. The second point is what Mr. – the second dimension is what Mr. Trump himself – how he looks at the world. What is his vision? His vision is transactional. Alliances are transactions. They are not unconditional. They are, they are uh, very unlike the alliance system or systems which the Americans have built up with their Asian and uh, <coughs> European allies ever since the end of the 1940s. A transactional alliances and a logical, in that worldview, and a logical dislike of multilateral partnerships. Because if you're transactional, you want your partners to be divided, preferably weak, uh, so that you can have the best possible transaction with them. Make them pay through the nose. Uh, it's easier to do that if your partners come piecemeal rather than as a collective. It's easier for the United States to negotiate with country X or country Y than to negotiate with uh, 28, soon, uh, well, 20, yeah, 20, uh, 27 and soon 28 partners of the United States within NATO operating as a collective. Uh, and the third dimension, maybe the most important, but it's still a conjecture hypothesis, is the personality of Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump uh, 
has a psychological profile which is very similar uh, to that of uh, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II. <laughs> not talking about the politics, don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I'm not engaging in, in, a, in a cheap critique. Simply the man has this arrogance, this pretentiousness, this schoolyard bully aspect, this very great difficulty on focusing on a given topic for uh, particularly long. If you look at the descriptions of contemporary observers of Wilhelm II or of subsequent historians, you will find something which is very, very close to what you can apply uh, to, uh, to Mr. Trump. And that has in itself substantial consequences in terms of the manner in which policy is produced, both domestically and internationally. And uh, that is not the same as saying that the guy is going to be impeached in six months. Uh, Wilhelm II abdicated after close to 30 years in power. It can go on for a long time, actually. Uh, uh, so don't even draw any comfort from the comparison, if that's what you may have begun to think. Uh, but it does mean that it will be the same man who will be able at one moment to deliver a perfectly decent speech and the next day to get into a Twitter storm uh, of incredible rage and intemperance, like uh, the one on Saturday, the day after his Friday speech in front of Congress. A last point on what has changed uh, on the American side. Uh, and this is a very serious point. It's one which, one which is quite discussable. I mean, uh, my mind is not entirely set, even if I am afraid that the cement is actually hardening a little bit. Uh, once you declare an alliance to be transactional, it becomes transactional it's no longer possible to walk back the arrow of time. A, uh, even if it turns out at the end of the day that American policy towards its allies is identical to that of previous American presidents, that is, complaining loudly about the insufficient defense spending of the Europeans, or of the Asians. This is par for the course. There's nothing particularly new about that one. That's not the one which worries me, by the way. If it's, entre, if it, quote unquote, is only that, it still won't be like previous American presidents. It's a little bit, you know, Copernicus said, the earth is not at the center of the universe, the sun is at the center of the universe. Once he said that, there was no going back. And I'm afraid there's that quality also in what is happening. So what do we do? Uh, what happens next? Well, first of all, all of America's friends and allies, partners in the positive sense uh, of the word, uh, are compelled to hedge uh, because of the uncertainties created by the factors which I just enumerated, including, by the way, Brexit. Uh, how do you hedge? If you're, if you're in East Asia, and if you're the Prime Minister of Australia, and you get hung up, you have the real Donald who bangs down the phone in the middle of the conversation, well, your hedge may be to get closer to China. That's a hedge. Or, and or, because hedges are not necessarily mutually exclusive, you continue to ramp up Australian defense spending. And or, as the Australians briefly did in the late 60s, early 70s, at the time of the Vietnam War, you may think about going nuclear. They actually did that. A, before changing their minds. If you're in Europe, what are the hedges? Well, one is to cozy up to Mr. Putin. Uh, some do this for not simply for out of interest, but possibly even out of affinity, not to say pleasure. Uh, think uh, Hungary, think Orban. I think he's quite happy 
with that sort of hedge. I'm not even sure he sees it as a hedge. A, maybe in less uh, uh, in terms which are not of an affinity nature, think maybe uh, policies of the Czech Republic. A, and all of us, to some degree, may be tempted to engage in that hedge at different moments in time. A second hedge, you go <coughs> into bilateral reinsurance. A, uh, you see some of that, and of course Sweden, which has had a long-standing bilateral defense relationship with the United States of America, uh, which I have to assume still exists, uh, even though I find it extremely difficult to get my Swedish, uh, to get Swedish officials to actually talk about it, uh, notwithstanding everything that has been published about it in the unclassified American material. Uh, well, bilateral, maybe, uh, but if you're dealing with the real Donald, you're dealing with somebody who prefers weak and vulnerable interlocutors because they pay better. They pay more. You can get more. So what may have been affordable bilaterally in the past is probably going to be more expensive in the future. And I think I'm not misreading the character of Donald Trump when I say that. So it doesn't look like a great hedge. In a way, it's even worse than the, than the Putin hedge. Thirdly, you have the Euro hedge. More European security, more European defense. You have the Polish president expressing views on the need for the European nuclear deterrent. Would that have been said two years ago? I assume not. Uh, you hear it in some German circles as well. Um, uh, what's the name of the city U guy uh, last November uh, talking about a European nuclear deterrent built on the French and the British uh, nuclear forces? Um, uh, uh, his name will come back. Uh, or the Frankfurt Allgemeine doing a, an opinion piece along the same lines. Uh, and this can be fueled also by the impact of Brexit, some things which were not possible before in the framework of European security and defense policy appear to have become slightly easier to do with the Brits having decided to pull out of the European Union. So you can create a European military headquarters, uh, 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 you can create a European uh, a uh, security research, defense research program. Uh, you can even create maybe a European defense fund a, in order to provide a multilateral leverage so that uh, a defense procurement uh, uh, a, a, a is positively influenced in the direction of standardization of materiel and optimization of uh, uh, defense economics as, as a consequence. Uh, that's a nice hedge, assuming it's really available, because the degree of homogeneity of approaches within the EU27 is not absolutely straightforward on this particular on this particular score. Uh, the paying hedge. To pay is also a hedge. Uh, that's probably the lowest penalty hedge the lowest risk hedge, but of course it's unpleasant because it burns a hole in your pocket. Uh, but still, that one makes sense because you will please Mr. Trump, since that is what he's asking for. If the, you lose the Americans on the way, or if the Americans uh, go off the reservation uh, towards Asia or God knows where, you're still better off because at least you will have improved your own defense capabilities in the European context. So you're, you're spending the money not for Mr. Trump, but for yourself, in effect. So that's the low penalty pledge, uh, hedge. It's the one which I would tend to advocate. Uh, uh, but of course, it's easier for some to achieve it 
than for others. Uh, France is doing 1.9% of GDP. Uh, Germany is doing 1.2%. So when I hear Mrs. Merkel and Mrs. von der Leyen and Herr Schäuble in Munich say the other day, we will, uh, uh, we will do 2% within the time frame. Well, uh, if it were 2% in 2017, that would mean raising the defense budget from 35 billion to 60 billion. 35 billion to 60 billion. And if you're thinking ahead 2024, 2025, which is normally the aim point for reaching 2%, since Germany's GDP increases close to 2% a year, add another six to the figure, and you get 70 billion. Germany's defense budget doubling over a period of nine years. It's not undoable, by the way. It's not unfeasible. But wow, is that a change. Uh, and will the German taxpayer be happy to do it? I don't know. Uh, so the availability of, of these hedges is variable. They have, some of them have perverse effects. I'm no great advocate of the Putin hedge. Uh, although, coming to Sweden for a moment, uh, I, I'm, I'm always ra rather impressed by the, the gap today in what I see in Finland and what I see in Sweden. In Finland, I see a country which has a high degree of dependence on Russia, this is something which we point out in our report. If, if Finland were to join NATO, there would be negative consequences for Finland. A, uh, because economic ties, human ties, that all of this would... Uh, but at the same time, the Finns are dead serious when it comes to keeping the Russians on good behavior. You know, the, last, the latest story when the Russians were transferring Iskanders to Kaliningrad and, a, and a, some of the Russian combat aircraft which were escorting the aerial convoy just by chance found themselves on the wrong side of, the, of Russian Finnish airspace. What did the Finns do? Well, first they were there. They were waiting for the Russians. And when the Russians got too close, they lit up the sky, the Finns. I don't know how many watts they blew into the eyes of the Russian pilots, but enough to take their photographs. And the photographs went to Moscow. So this is, don't pr and this was not about going to the press. This was about going to the Russians. So low provocation, high determination, and strategic prudence. Sweden, I have the impression it's a bit the other way around. You have reduced your relations with Russia through a combination of initiatives, yours and that of the Russians. There's perfect interaction here. You have brought your relations to a point at which there would be very little penalty if you join NATO, because I'm not sure what the Russians could do to you, which they aren't already doing to you short of invading Jutland. But otherwise, you know, what is there? What is there? You know, another strategic nuclear simulated bombing run? Like on Good Friday 2013, they were doing this even before they invaded Crimea. And was there anybody to meet them from the Swedish side? Not on that day. NATO did it. Uh, uh, so, and, you know, so, the combination of high profile, uh, 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 unpleasant relations between Russia and Finland, uh, Sweden, pardon, on the one hand, and the reticence to back this up with the relevant level of threat of use of force. Uh, uh, in the Trumpian world, it is not going to be a great idea to be unserious about security and defense. Putin on the one side, Trump on the other, a divided Europe in the middle. Uh, the penalty for not taking uh, 
security and defense with the utmost seriousness will be very, very high. A word in conclusion, because uh, I'm sure that what I've just said will provoke questions. I don't, I don't, I don't go on. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for the questions afterwards. Uh, a word on France, the French perspective. Uh, I don't know who will be elected in, in April. It's anybody's guess. Every week has its incredible surprise, which is why I'm not simply being coy. You know, uh, 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 I have not gone secretly to Ladbrokes and placed a big bet. Uh, uh, which is something you discover about uh, the, a number of people when uh, reading these, this English book about uh, the minutiae of the run-up to Brexit, you know, and you discover that all sorts of British politicians were saying one thing, and they were going and they were betting in the betting shop in another uh, in another direction. Now, I, I am completely flummoxed by uh, the range of possibilities as we are today. 45, 45 days away, 46 days away uh, from the first round of the presidential election. Anything can happen, excellent or terrible. And, it's, and the discrepancy is that wide. It's not simply between sort of okay and sort of not so okay. It's between excellent, that is pro-European, pro-reform at one end of the spectrum, and the other is the end of the European Union on the other. It is a very, very broad range of possibilities. But assuming that it, that it is not the bad part which, which wins, uh, and that it's reform in one form or another which wins, right wing or left wing, or center left rather, uh, and center left I think would have more credibility than right wing, not for political reasons but simply because it, is, it will be very difficult for the right to secure a mandate uh, for reform when the, main, when the main topic of conversation from the right is about, its, uh, about the relationship between its candidate uh, and uh, whatever, <coughs> whatever practices he may have been engaging in uh, on, the, on the budget, on the personal uh, work front, if I can use a polite set of words. Uh, very difficult to get a, a mandate under those conditions. So let's assume we have reform. Uh, reform in France is possible if you have a mandate and then a presidential election followed immediately by a legislative election, because we also have that coming along. Uh, it's probably the best you can get in terms of uh, being able to engage in reform. If you have that mandate, reform will happen. And, if reform, and reform is not a vast enterprise. You know, some people confuse the difficulty of promoting reform in France. And it is difficult to promote reform in France. They confuse that aspect with the other aspect, which is the degree of reform which would actually be necessary to get France uh, moving forward. And the paradox is that the first one that is, getting the reform process to begin is more difficult than the second one. That is, it wouldn't actually require an enormous amount of reform to get the country moving, uh, moving again. So if we have reform, French-German relationship will be able to pick up again. Uh, and if the French-German relationship picks up again, and assuming that things don't get pear-shaped in Germany next September, that's another, that's another unknown, although there the discrepancies are of the uh, sort of okay and not, so, not, and not so okay alternatives, not quite as dire as in France. But if things turn out okay in Germany, then I think we would have an honest uh, possibility of building up uh, the security and defense dimension of the EU 27. And that brings us back to how you deal with a Trumpian world. We're going, to get, we're going to need all of the NATO that we can get or keep, and we're going to need all of the Europe that we can acquire if we want to be able to deal with, uh, with this transactional post-unconditional uh, uh, post alliance world on the one hand and a dynamic Russia on the other, not to mention the problems we have in the Middle East.
I've spoken too long. I'm very sorry. <coughs> Thank you very much, Francois, for that very enlightening presentation. Uh, I have a few follow-up questions, but I think I'll save them to last. So with that, I ask the rest of our panel, Christer Bingius and Anna Wislander, to come up. And starting perhaps with Christer, who will give a few remarks. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you to you, Francois, for, as always, a very elegant and lucid presentation. On the Baltic Sea region... Uh, my starting point would be the conclusions that we uh, drew in the inquiry uh, that I chaired last year. Russian aggression against Ukraine represents the greatest challenge to the European security order since the end of the Cold War. There is reason to believe that Russia seeks a security system that basically allows it to maintain specific spheres of influence along its borders. And Foreign Minister Lavrov said as much in Munich. He pleaded for a post-West world order. Uh, from a strict Swedish perspective, though, we concluded that an isolated attack against our country for all practical reasons could be excluded. But we also said that Sweden would be drawn into a potential uh, Russian-Baltic uh, military conflict, and this at an early stage. Um, the Baltic Sea region is de facto a strategic unity, one strategic unity, both for an attacker and for a defender, both for Sweden and for Finland. As the Swedish-Egyptian entrepreneur Refat El Sayed, well known to uh, all Swedes for his strange but very articulate way of expressing things, put it, we all swim in the same boat. <laughs> Having said this, we also concluded that the Russian attack against the Baltic states is highly unlikely. The only scenario that we pointed to uh, was a kind of regime collapse in Moscow where the political leadership there could want to divert public attention by military external aggression. So what's changed since then, as you put it? It's uh, clearly Brexit and it's uh, Trump, plus the specter of Marine Le Pen uh, in the Palais de l'Essai. Uh, Brexit, what does Brexit mean for European cooperation? Well, first of all, I think need, it, need, it, it needs to be said once again, the price will be paid by the Brits and in particularly by its youth, by the British youth. Basically, I see three scenarios. First of all, uh, theoretically at least, a big leap forward. I know that former Prime Minister Jöran Persson argues that Brexit is an opportunity. Uh, Europe can focus on, quote-unquote, itself, making the reforms necessary without constantly being obstructed by the perfid Albion. <laughs> Number two, renationalization. EU members taking home competences, formally handed over to Brussels, or simply acting against further integration. Number three, muddling through with a strong element of a European Union at different speeds. Assuming that Marine Le Pen will not end up at the Palais de l'Essai, in that case I fear that we will only see unpredictable European chaos, the inner core, Germany, France, and maybe Italy, and maybe the Benelux, will form a nucleus of its own with Germany as both the obvious anchor and engine. Germany's role will be stronger, if not crucial, and every country in Europe will, Nolens, Volens, have to deal with Germany and relate to Germany. The message from the Chancellor when she met our Prime Minister last month, as I understand it, was simple. Germany will be there, Germany will take its responsibility, but, she said, and this is crucial, we can't do it alone. And this will not necessarily be an easy one for Sweden. As we all know, fundamentally, EU is of extreme importance for Sweden as a welfare state. But such a development with a core European uh, Union will force us to make a choice of values where we are not quite comfortable. Are we part of this core Europe? What about common defense? What about the euro? Trump. Trump has made it obvious that established partnerships, alliances, rules and protocols mean little to him. His presidency, simply put, 
poses a stress test for Europe, for transatlantic relations, and for the world as a whole. It's probably the economic part of his agenda, his views on free trade, where most stands at risk for the global community and for America itself. He has said as much, he wants to abolish all multilateral trade agreements. TPP in the Pacific region will be put to death, NAFTA renegotiated, and TTIP with the EU simply cancelled. I'm convinced, though, that the U.S. for the foreseeable future will maintain its position as the leader within the global system. Its position is underpinned by wits and strength, both in terms of diplomacy and military might. But the year 2017 might well be the year when China finally and unrevocably stepped out as a leading actor on the international arena and a very, very serious competitor to the United States. I apostrophe Carl Bildt at Davos. The leader, well, he wasn't at Davos. Yes, he was. Uh, at least he said, uh, I found this quote, the leader of the world's largest communist party came to Davos and praised capitalism and free trade. The hands hardly stopped clapping. Trump is playing right into the Chinese hands. And as any undergraduate of macroeconomics would tell, the US will pay the price. On security, we obviously will hear calls for a closer European cooperation in the field of security policy as some sort of compensation for Trump. But I'd like to quote Ambassador Ischinger at the Munich Security Conference. The calls for Europe to become a strategic counterweight to the US are purely aspirational. In reality, no such option exists. In the short and medium term, Europeans cannot do without the US security guarantee. And as a result, we must work to convince the new administration of the importance of a united and peaceful Europe. In the long term, the liberal global order will endure only if supported by both pillars of the transatlantic partnership. And the Swedish government was quick to draw this conclusion. In his letter of congratulations to the president-elect, Prime Minister Löfven of Sweden stressed the importance of a continued Swedish-American cooperation in the field of security policy. Sweden, for its part, has, and I will conclude here, an interesting dilemma. We have decided to base our security on a close working relationship with the United States, even signed a protocol to that effect last year. How do we then best deal with what seems to be an irrational force in the White House alone or with others? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I will do, uh, uh, as I have uh, been asked by Katerina, to uh, make a few remarks on uh, perhaps more of a French uh, perspective on, on Baltic Sea security. Uh, Francois, he just uh, came here and looked at the title and uh, was a question mark in his head. Is there a French perspective on, on the security of this region? And of course, uh, I think we all know that uh, if something major happens uh, up here, we would need uh, outside assistance in order to, to solve it. And uh, uh, first hand, I think everybody will look at the, the United States for that. That does not mean that uh, other major states are not important in, in dealing with the situation here. Uh, and I think France could uh, uh, play an important role uh, up here also. Uh, question is, uh, are they focusing up here and, and what could they do in, in this regard in, in that case? Uh, I think France is often perceived as having no interest in the Baltic states. It's, it's, it's perceived as a country that is facing south uh, as opposed to east uh, when it comes to threat perceptions. Um, I would say if you look, uh, scrutinize a bit of what the French reactions these past years, that it's, it has some moderation to it. Uh, actually, after Crimea, the illegal annexation of Crimea in, in March 2014, uh, we had uh, uh, NATO acting uh, out of surprise, uh, rather modestly, one would say, with some assurance measures. And as you know, uh, the U.S. moved first, uh, uh, reinforcing the Baltic Air Police mission and also putting about 600 troops in the Baltic states and Poland within a couple of months uh, to reassure. But actually, second, uh, second third in acting was France, 
who re reassured the Baltic Air Police Mission uh, with additional jet fighters and also offered uh, AWACS uh, surveillance support uh, at the same time as the UK and at the same level, I would say. And you can note also other countries, Germany, as, as was pointed out here, Chris, uh, Kister, acting more slowly in that case. So that was the situation then. I think France lived up to, to responsibility as a major ally uh, at a modest level, but that was the level of, of all actions at, at that point. Uh, also another initiative uh, was the spearhead force that uh, NATO decided upon uh, at the Wales summit in 2014. Uh, brigade size, very rapid reaction force uh, to be able to act as a deterrent uh, to meet what we had seen uh, Russia mobilizing within 48 hours uh, ahead of, of uh, Crimea. Uh, and this, this force has uh, seven uh, framework nations leading, uh, leading it and all are European nations and France is one of them. So France will have the leadership in 2020, which means that if something happens, then uh, there would be a, a big reaction from, from France at that time. Uh, noteworthy also, the US is not one of those nations leading that force at all. It's only supplying uh, uh, support, strategic support to that force. So a couple of positive signs on, on uh, what you, you could have expected more uh, and what everyone thought was that now that NATO, after the... Warsaw Summit here 2016 decided upon enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states and in Poland. Uh, the battle groups of, of uh, battalion size that are now being uh, put in place. France, uh, everyone more or less was expected to take one uh, leadership for one of those battle groups. Uh, but that did not happen. Uh, and uh, instead, uh, Canada actually stepped up and took on, uh, took on that responsibility. So now it's the US, it's Canada, it's Germany, and it's the UK. And uh, I think that it would have been preferable for, for the region, and perhaps for Europe, if, if France had taken on that role. No, Canada will do an excellent job. Uh, it's not that. But for the dynamic of, of what we see here in, in Europe, it could have been an advantage. Um, and it's also uh, connected to what has been a struggle uh, within NATO uh, this past year, is how to perceive Russia. Uh, they were striving towards a strategy uh, on Russia to the Warsaw Summit and did not really reach as far as some countries would have hoped for. And uh, part of that is how to view Russia. Is it a threat? It's, is it an adversary or is it a strategic partner? as the official documents actually still say that Russia is. And in this sense, uh, President Hollande was, was pretty outspoken ahead of the Warsaw Summit and said that Russia to France is not an adversary. Russia is not a threat. Russia is actually a partner. Ru Russia did wrong, uh, annexing Crimea, uh, but uh, still, uh, in the major uh, whole, that is how, how, how France views Russia. Uh, and this is a struggle still within the alliance and will continue to be. And as we heard, uh, this, this, um, the power field that Europe is now captured within, with President Trump and his uh, positive view on uh, what could be expressed as wilt for a detente towards Russia, and, and uh, Mr. Putin and the expressions himself, where, where will we end up in this uh, puzzle in this region? I think that's important to, to address. Uh, a few words, I can just end up with President Trump, France. Uh, one of the reasons, the major reason that France could not assume a, a, a responsibility for this force uh, in the Baltic Sea is that it's strained in its war towards the terror. Uh, so it had mass, or you all know about the terror attacks and, and, and uh, what, what, what France is facing in that regard. So the military is, is strained. Uh, also doing major operations elsewhere, ISIS, uh, Mali, and uh, so on. Um, and uh, President Trump has expressed uh, that NATO should do more on terrorism, uh, and uh, so that could possibly then, could that be something uh, where we see a new dynamic coming up? Um, so far, France has not been very keen on NATO taking on a, a bigger role in, in uh, fighting terrorism, actually. Um, this has been more of a coalition of the willing among states, as in ISIS, or more for the EU to handle border control and, and other softer security issues. Uh, 
So, so far we haven't really seen anything happening there either, but uh, it, it's one possibility ahead perhaps of finding common ground and, and revitalizing these relations. Thank you, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, and could I ask the rest of the panel to come up please, François and Christelle? So thank you all of you for your extremely informative presentations and I had prepared some questions you have managed to address most of them in advance but I would just ask you a few follow-up questions before we allow the audience to participate. Uh, we have an extremely knowledgeable audience here today so there will be time for you also. Uh, but, but if I start with uh, François. Uh, you were talking about the differences between the Swedish stance and the Finnish one, and uh, naming particularly that the Finns are dead serious about their defense and the Swedes perhaps uh, not being as serious. Um, previously, you have observed Sweden. You have talked about Swedish security partially as still being ruled by party politics. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on this and on how you see the Swedish relationship to its security. Yeah, I'd, I'd be, be happy, happy to do that. Um, uh, in capsule form, Finland is strategically careful and militarily robust. Sweden is strategically not careful and militarily not so robust. And that's the view of an outsider. A, uh, uh, the tone of your relations with Russia, and I'm not saying that it's Sweden's fault, uh, but as in most divorces, you know, it, uh, there's, uh, there's an element of interaction. Uh, uh, to have a really bad relationship usually both sides have to agree on the fact that the relation has to be bad. A, uh, and that is pretty much, what you, pretty much what you have. What struck me here in Stockholm when you would be coming for our cons uh, in the framework of our, the drafting of our report, we'd have consultations here in town. A, you know, in Finland, two-thirds of the population is not interested in joining NATO. Only a small third actually wants to see Finland go into NATO. That apparently unbridgeable gap did not in any size, shape or form hinder our own discussions in Finland. The discussion was about security and defense. What is the best way to approach the issue? It wasn't about uh, whether party X or party Y was in favor or against joining NATO. Uh, and indeed, as a Frenchman, uh, but this has to do with Finnish institutions uh, rather than simply with public attitudes, I found myself in an environment which was familiar to me. That is, where the population tends to be legitimist. That is, if the president and the prime minister come out saying, for reasons X and Y, we should be changing our policy as follows, then the population accepts that. Which is why, if you ask me, you know, could Finland change its mind about joining NATO under certain circumstances, the answer is yes, and probably not with any greater difficulty than could be the case here in Sweden. Now, on Sweden, I found, on the contrary, an extraordinarily polarized atmosphere. People hardly on speaking terms with each other. Uh, you know, one saying, oh, you will be seeing so-and-so tomorrow morning. Oh, no, no, I can't see him with you. <laughs> uh, and vice versa. Uh, uh, that somehow the debate here was much more fraught than in Finland, despite the feeling that strategically you are maybe somewhat less exposed than Finland is, and your border is not with Russia. Your border is with Finland and with Norway. Uh, 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 
And the explanation I sought and which I got in my discussions, you know, why is this? You know, I ask, why is this? Why, 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 is, why are feelings so intense about this issue? And, and ditto in the media treatment. You know, Finland and Sweden have both signed host nation support agreements. Finland, this was a non-issue, if only because essentially it was an executive issue. <laughs> in the case of Sweden, you had articles in the press about how this meant that nuclear weapons were going to be installed on Swedish soil. And I'm not inventing this. And serious articles of this sort written by serious people and drawing rebuttals from uh, having to draw rebuttals from serious people. It's a very, very awkward debate. And with the backdrop, which is that public opinion is about 50-50, or 45-45, if, if I can put it that way. It ac actually, there is, there, is, there is less of an imbalance in public opinion than there is in Finland. Katarina, can I just say one word in reaction to what Anna said? Because Please she gave a, a, great, a great overview on the, on, the, on, the French, on the French situation. Like her, I would have wanted to see France uh, be part of NATO's enhanced force presence uh, in the Baltics and, and Poland. Uh, uh, but she is right. At the time when the decision had to be taken, uh, our forces were pretty burned out. Uh, uh, and not because of having to deter or defend against possible enemy action, which is what the enhanced force presence is about, but in having to deal with actual violence, actual attacks. Domestically, 10,000 soldiers were engaged in uh, the uh, dealing with the terrorist issue. In West Africa, uh, 5,000 in an incredibly hostile environment in terms of climate and geology and so on, and in an area the size of Europe. And if I say the size of Europe, it's also to remind people this is not about France, this is about Europe. If there had been a jihadistan created in Mali four years ago, which is what was happening, uh, we would be in pretty much the same situation at that end of the geographical scope as we were when Daesh created a jihadistan in Iraq and Syria in 2014, a year later. The difference between France and the others is that in Mali we were able to step in and prevent it from happening, whereas in 2014 in Iraq the Americans went AWOL and the Europeans were not there. And we are still trying to liberate Mosul as we're speaking here. This is what would have happened in Mali. We would, we would probably be fighting our way through the ruins of Bamako, having bombed the rest of the country into little pieces. This is what would have happened. Uh, and the stuff that we are led to do in Africa these days, we do pretty much on our own. Now we get some help from the Germans, by the way. The Germans have actually begun to integrate the notion that maybe it is unwise to let 95% of the burden fall on the back of the French. And the Germans are helping us more and more, and that is something for which we are uh, extremely, uh, extremely glad. Voilà, that was just what okay, I wanted to you. add. Thank you, and it ac actually leads me to the next question, talking about hedges. You outlined a few hedges, uh, François, uh, namely, well, the bilateral hedge or cozy up to Putin hedge, as I understood it, is not a, the best choice, perhaps. Uh, we also heard about the European hedge, and I heard Christer somewhat referring to that also in his speech. But that made me think about, and besides the, the, the most important one, of course, the paying hedge, uh, it made me think of an additional one. Could there be a terrorist terrorism fighting hedge, for instance. You, I hear you now speaking about France and how so few countries actually yeah. have contributed to this. And uh, when uh, President Trump speaks about eradicating radical Islam from the face of the earth, could combating terrorism actually be a way to secure either stronger Euro European 
uh, defense cooperation with France or stronger commitments from the part of the Americans? Uh, my answer will be very brief. Uh, we have a coalition operating against Daesh in the Middle East a, uh, and in Libya. A, it hasn't been put into NATO colors because there are many other countries than those which belong to NATO participating in that operation. If to please Mr. Trump, uh, one could paint a NATO star on the European and American aircraft and drones operating in that war, or the helicopters, well, why not? A, uh, a, uh, this may be a comparatively cheap hedge. Uh, but I'm not sure that Trump has given very much uh, thought uh, to that, uh, uh, to that, uh, uh, to that, to that side of, of things, and I don't think that we we are going to get off the hook that easily. What worries me rather more about that uh, 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 about that issue is that Trump, at the same time, wants to have extremely quick results. Now, as a Frenchman, I can understand that one would want to have quick results against uh, against Daesh terrorism. But when quick results may mean over the next few weeks that the Americans are going to use the, uh, y the Kurdish YPG as spear bearers to free Raqqa, uh, I sort of get worried because ethnic cleansing of Sunni Arabs by Kurds uh, of that particular persuasion. These are not the Talabani uh, Barzani people. These are the uh, PKK, PKK types. A, uh, this is probably not the best way to introduce uh, a modicum of stability uh, in that part of the Middle East. Daesh is a terrorist organization, but Daesh is also an organization which represents in its own horrible way the interests of a certain segment of the population of Iraq and of Syria. It's a little bit like Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization which defends the, represents the interests of the Shia in southern Lebanon uh, or, in, or in Syria. A uh, ditto with Daesh. If you don't have anything to solve the problem of representation of the two-thirds of the Sunni who compose Syria's population, or the majority of Sunnis who represent the, the northern part of Iraq's population, a, uh, we may destroy the caliphate, but we will not destroy jihadi terrorism. And that would not be good news. So uh, Trump, well, we'll see what comes out of the Mattis plan, which is now being in its final works in, in Washington. Uh, but I greatly fear that it is going to be an American Kurdish plan. And uh, uh, whether that is going to translate two or three years down the line in terms of less terrorism in Europe or more terrorism in Europe, I don't know. All right. Uh, before letting in the audience, I want to um, get back to the to the to our region and namely to our country, Sweden. Uh, there's a sense of urgency here. We are in the Trumpian era, and something has to be changed. This is not a good time to not be serious about our defense, as you mentioned, Francois. And I want to ask all of the panel, uh, what hedge, if we use that word, or what measure uh, could be and should be done uh, rather immediately? Uh, and I will start with uh, Anna. Thank you, Katharina. Uh, well, I think uh, one immediate hedge uh, for, for Sweden, was that a question? Yes, yes uh, it's to increase defense spending. I think that's really important. It has been mentioned here. But uh, we have, uh, not only for the obvious reasons that we need to increase our capability to defend Sweden, uh, it's also what Francois mentioned, the transactional way that the new presidency is looking at the world. Uh, it's not a good thing to have 1% uh, of your defense spending, even though we are not an ally. <laughs> Uh, uh, of the of one uh, percent of our GMP and moving um, below one percent next year if there is not an increase, uh, I don't think that lands well in in uh, Washington D.C. Actually, uh, and we should, uh, for various reasons, look at this. But this is also one very important thing since we put a lot of emphasis on the Swedish-U.S. Um, defense relation. So that is important. 
Uh, I also think, though, that we should not cry too much for those years where we spent a lot of money on international missions, even though we did not spend that much. Uh, but uh, it was not in vain. Uh, what we uh, got then was a lot of trust from uh, allies uh, that we built relations with. What we did in Afghanistan, what we did in Libya, uh, and we should not underestimate that uh, credibility that we got uh, by doing those things. And we got it, and I think if we compare Sweden and Finland, often as twins like this, I think if Sweden earned a little bit more because we did a little bit more in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and we did a little bit more in Libya. And we can use that uh, in a smart way ahead if we play our cards right. And then third thing, I, would, I don't know if that's a hedge, but I would like to uh, just say a warning, word of warning on, on the open door policy and what we see going on now in the dynamics of, of, of this region, where we, uh, both Finland and Sweden, keeping our doors, uh, our options open uh, security-wise, and we should, of course. Uh, but I had a conversation with uh, an advisor to one of the French uh, um, possibly French president candidates, I should say, uh, who was talking about uh, other countries uh, in this open door, uh, of, about Ukraine, about Moldova, about uh, Georgia, and what's coming up ahead. What, what, is, what is the Europe? Uh, will the door close towards these countries when it comes to joining the European institutions? And uh, we should be uh, aware that these kind of dynamics that happen that are perhaps not aimed uh, specifically at us could also have effects upon our decisions ahead. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, I don't know what you can say in your professional capacity, but if you well, would like uh, to reflect on the... I think talking about has the, been said. the hedges, I mean, clearly mm -hmm. it's defense spending. Mm -hmm. uh, if I should be self-critical to the report that I chaired, I mean, maybe we took a little bit too light, lightly on the pressure uh, that we could come into. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I think it's very clear that we will see uh, in the future years from the United States is demand on increased spending. Having said this, you can add, interestingly enough, there is an element in the leftist opinion in Sweden that is very much in favor of this. I mean, if you take the uh, editorial page of Aftonblad, the main... Uh, social democratic whatever uh, tabloid they are very much arguing for inc radically increased uh, spending having said this uh, I mean this will not fix our security basic security problem I mean at the end of that day it will be marginal effects we would have to remilitarize our society immensely if we should come up to critical uh, critical uh, uh, level but defense spending and it's not the hedges uh, Francois said it's, it's probably, probably simply logical. And then on, uh, on the international operations, we had, as most of you know, an inqu the inquiry, the public inquiry on our Afghanistan engagement went public a couple of days ago. And w one uh, divided different objectives, uh, our engagement into different objectives and goals. And one goal where we kind of achieved a positive result was precisely in, uh, in engaging internationally and militarily with our partners, so that's... Mm -hmm. Francois? Yeah, a, uh, first of all, on the, on the open door, a, uh, you may have seen, uh, uh, and if you haven't, you should, uh, there's a piece by Michael O'Hanlon, uh, uh, which more or less suggests, uh, I was at Brookings now, who suggests that there should be a U.S.-Russian agreement, a sort of Yalta too which would uh, a, compel uh, those who live outside of the alliance system uh, to uh, adopt permanent neutrality. A, and that would include uh, a, not only the former Soviet space, but also the Nordic space and the Balkans. A, if you think that this is not a great idea, you're right, because <laughs> it would mean that Sweden and Finland, for example, would no longer be able to stay in the defense and security aspect of the European Union. That is actually pointed out in the article, that the countries of that area would be allowed to join the European Union, those who, uh, but they would not be able to join the security and defense aspect. Uh, an you know, extraordinary proposal uh, 
where a country which has the GDP of Spain, that is Russia, uh, would actually have this permanent droit de regard on the fate of the, uh, 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 of the 150 million people uh, who live in these gray areas, that is, have the great, greater population in Russia herself. Uh, 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 so, uh, so much uh, for shutting the open door. It may be shut before, before you know it. Uh, Michael O'Hanlon is not a red meat Republican, as far as I can remember. Uh, uh, it's the sort of thing which I guess could please Trump. Uh, uh, and you, would, you, would want, you want to be very careful about yourselves. As to the risks in this gray area, uh, for me at currently the highest level of risk is in the West Balkans, which we tend to forget about. But if you are Putin, if you are Russia, if you have the GDP of Spain and the defense budget of France, because that, that's the level of Russian defense spending today, it's, the same, it's about the same of France. Uh, 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 in, in the most generous definition of French defense spending. Uh, uh, you, you're probably not going to want to uh, face Article 5 issues. And you don't want to face the risk of attrition. So what do you do, apart from Crimea or Syria? Uh, you may want to do a coup in Montenegro, but shucks, that didn't work. <laughs> uh, 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 but, you know, you have, you're helping your friends in Serbia, you have a, a, a small point in niche where you can maybe start building stuff up. You've got a friend in Hungary next door. Uh, uh, Bosnia is in deep trouble. Uh, uh, Republika Srpska is uh, open to every single uh, form of p possible subversion. Uh, uh, stuff could happen there and which would affect the European Union more than anybody else because we're just about the only people who, can, who could actually do something in that area today. We, are, we have reserve powers in Bosnia and we have reserve powers in Kosovo. And uh, before we know it, we may have to exercise those powers. And I'm not sure the Americans would rush, uh, would rush to our help uh, in that particular set of circumstances. A Swedish hedge. <coughs> There's one hedge which you, you folks didn't mention. I, I was a bit surprised, and I'm not saying that I'm advocating it, but if I'm not a member of NATO, maybe I, one of my hedges would be to consider joining NATO. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, Fair point. <laughs> just, uh, I, you know, on, uh, ticking down the list. I didn't mention it because, of course, I was speaking as somebody who, who comes from a country which is in NATO. But if you're not in NATO, and if bilateral is going to become much more onerous or even punitive but than before, does that change the terms of the NATO debate in Sweden? Question to you guys. Thank you. And with that, I will open up the floor for questions. Uh, starting here, please uh, wait for the microphone. And if we could get a microphone. And also, I would like to remind you that this is being recorded. So please introduce yourselves once you receive the microphone. Yes. Thank you. I'm Thomas Bartelman. I'm <coughs> retired ambassador. Question to uh, Francois. You uh, referred to the polarized debate on NATO here. And quite predictably, the election of President Trump, of course, was taken by both sides as uh, <coughs> corroborating their positions. And I think our foreign minister, in a memorable comment uh, quite uh, shortly after the election said that this will make the NATO supporters in Sweden start biting their nails, uh, if I remember. And Krista is not, has not taken sides, but you ended by saying, uh, how do we deal with an erratic man, uh, together or alone? Um, and I would like to tempt you to venture a bit out on this thin ice. Yeah. Okay, but maybe we'll collect a couple. I'll, yes, I'll, I'll be happy to react. Do we have any more questions at this time? Okay, then I'll, I'll go. Okay, ahead. then we'll start venturing out on the thin ice. Who oh, feels the th compelled? The thin begin. ice. I was flying, uh, approaching the airport, and uh, I saw that there were there were many lakes which already had no ice on, and uh, even that I do not have. I will not have for support. Uh, uh, I read the summary of your, uh, the excellent summary of your report. 
I, I would have liked to say the summary of your excellent report, because your report has not been translated into English uh, or into Russian. Uh, uh, or into French. Yeah, I don't uh, know about that, Russian. Maybe, uh, some maybe some they did. Maybe yeah. they did. Maybe they did. But uh, I read the excellent summary. Uh, I, uh, uh, what did I? What are the conclusions I drew from your report, both in what you said and what, in what you didn't say? Because, as, as we all know, it's also what you, one doesn't say in these reports, which is uh, uh, which acquires importance of its own. Uh, because of the existence of a report. A, uh, one is that nothing deters like Article 5. A, and secondly, a, there, and this is what you didn't say, a, at least in the summary, uh, and that is that the downsides for Sweden of joining NATO are not are not particularly great. This is in contrast to the Finnish report, in which we go at some length into the issue of the downsides. That is, how would the Russians react? And uh, without revealing too many secrets, uh, uh, René Newbery and myself worked very particularly hard on that, on that section. And to the surprise, I think, of some, we agreed very deeply uh, on, 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 on that assessment, which is not an easy one to make. They were essentially saying the penalties would be real, the Russians would not like this at all, <coughs> and there would, be a, there would be a price to pay, and the Russians occasionally do things to remind people who are in vulnerable situations what sort of prices could be paid. Uh, remember the migrant flows in 2015 with the selective opening up of border points with Norway and Finland by our Russian friends. Just to make a little point, you know, yeah, it could be more than a thousand, could be a hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, a gentle reminder. Uh, but that given what we know about previous Soviet slash Russian reactions, to NATO enlargement ever since the first NATO enlargement occurred in 1951 with the entry of Turkey and Greece. Uh, and Turkey, by the way, was a, was a big thing, which, uh, which the Russians were very, the Soviets were very, very unhappy about. Ever since then, we know that there is a cycle in terms of refusal, opposition, uh, retribution, and eventual acceptance. And so, that provided that the upside, that is the improvement in the, the security and defense situation, would be substantial, then it would be possible to bear the burden of these negatives. Now in, the, in, the, in the Swedish case, you don't have too much of that downside. So that makes the calculus easier. On Article 5, uh, when Trump was asked about Article 5 applying to this or that Baltic nation during the campaign, you'll remember, uh, I think it was Estonia which came up, uh, 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 it was Estonia or Latvia. And he essentially said, well, it would only work if they had been paying. Transactional vision of Article 5, purely transactional. Uh, that obviously scared people, uh, particularly in the Baltics, but uh, not only. Uh, and since I've been saying that once you've declared that it's transactional, it probably stays transactional, this does challenge more than in the past the potency of Article 5. But for Article 5 to be fully potent, uh, you still have two things. One, of course, is what would happen to the credibility of the United States in facing its peer competitor. The Americans, by the way, don't use the word adversary when they talk about Russia or China either. A, uh, a, it's, a, uh, one has to be very, very careful in one's choice of words. Hardly no one does. I, I know one exception in which I was involved back in 1983 when we actually wrote in the French case, we wrote that the Soviet Union was our adversary. Uh, this came as a great shock. It was very deliberate 
the, there was a particular signal which Mitterrand wanted to send at that moment, etc. But uh, uh, the fact that you don't call the guy you're unhappy with an adversary doesn't mean that he's your friend. You know, it's, uh, very, very careful. Uh, but anyway, the United States not defending an ally would obviously weaken uh, its credibility facing serious competition. And I'm thinking here in particular of China. And secondly, of course, NATO is, of course, the United States is the lead nation, but it's not the only nation. And the fact that in NATO you do have 28 to 29 member states does give heft and depth to Article 5 uh, in a way which will probably make it survive even the vagaries of Mr. Of Mr. Trump. So, if I'm a Swede, and I'm not a Swede, and if I'm looking at Hedges, uh, and if I read what uh, you've been writing, and if I read what you have not been writing uh, uh, on the downside aspects, I think maybe this is, a, this is a pretty good time to join NATO. Uh, you'd, you'd, you'd probably want to do soundings with the Finns uh, uh, to see how it would play on the other side of the Gulf of Botnia. Uh, uh, because, of course, the Finnish report states very clearly, and there was no difficulty in arriving at a deep consensus on this one between the four of us, including, of course, our, our, our friend uh, Mats Bergqvist. Uh, and that was that the worst strategic outcome in the region is to have an align gang by one of the countries or the other of the countries. And that all other options, that is, the two out of NATO or the two in NATO, is better than the one where you have one in NATO and the other out, or the other in and the other and, and the first one out. Uh, so there would be uh, some complicated dancing, uh, choreography, uh, to, be, uh, to be considered. But maybe this is not the worst of time. Russia has had to reduce its defense budget substantially this year. That's why they got down to French levels now. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real decrease. You know, it's not, it is not a, you know, when you have the GDP of Spain, you know, you, there are limits to what you can actually do in terms of accumulating uh, firepower and, and so on. Uh, so maybe this, maybe this is a hedge which you could be, uh, which you could be looking at. But I'm not a Swede. Thank you, Francois. And I have seen no hands waving further on. Uh, it's also time for us to close up. I would just like to ask Anna and Krista if you would like to add some final comments. You're Anna, fine. Anna, want to say something? She's okay. <laughs> Krista, uh, any final comments? Uh, not really. I just say that you praised our report. I must reciprocate. Uh, your report was quite helpful. That's uh, why I was saying what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one uh, one uh, section that we copy pasted was precisely this psychological description of uh, how Russia has reacted uh, on any uh, new member of any country joining NATO. All right, thank you. One final comment yeah, from Anna. A very short comment then on, on uh, the risk of NATO and Trump becoming, or NATO becoming transactional and is that a slippery slope? Um, to my assessment, I think NATO will survive uh, President Trump. Um, I think uh, what he has put on the table is, is a negotiable deal. It's a deal, it could be a deal, uh, in his words. Uh, I'm more worried about the European Union. Uh, the fact that he actively supports Brexit and expects others to follow, that's a huge difference from 70 years of uh, American presidency who, who always supported European unity. Uh, and where will that lead us? That leaves it a lot up to us in Europe, I would say. Our resilience, our will to stick together. Uh, we will not get that much of support from, from Mr. Trump. Perhaps, though, an external... I would not say adversary then, but external uh, challenge, <laughs> challenge <laughs> to deal with together. Yes, thank you. <laughs>
So thank you very much. On behalf of the Stockholm Free World Forum and the Atlantic Council, we would like to thank the panel above all, but also to thank all of you for coming here today. So a big round of applause. Thank you.